that there's this quote that says the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. And I think that's what you heard this morning. But most importantly, we have to think about and take responsibility for the fact that we don't spend an enormous amount of time thinking about the future. Specific to our personal lives, nonetheless, or professional lives, or, or education in general. And in reality, and this just isn't me saying this, this is psychologists and sociologists and everybody else around there, we really actually accept all of the assumptions or givens of today, and we believe that's going to be what exists for tomorrow and for all, all eternity. And it's actually very hard for us to challenge our own assumptions and the givens that we live in on a day-to-day -day basis, and partly it's because of our cognitive processes. We basically have these non-conscious, subconscious processes that are going on that really don't allow us to change the view of the world. And so instead, we actually change our view to fit the world versus challenging our own assumptions. So instead of integrating the reality that we might see, we integrate it into the reality that we know because that's the only reality we know. And in many ways, what one of the Harvard psychologists calls this is that our brains, we have a psychological immune system. Our brain is hardwired to look for confirmation of our existing hypothesis. So we're not even designed to actually look for what might be different in the future because that's really not how our brain is wired. And on top of that, we lack the context to think about the future. That is, the future either looks just like the present or the past or some breathless fantasy about how computers are going to take over every aspect of our lives and supersaturate us, right? So how do we plan for something that we have no context for, and how do we plan for something where our brain is so hardwired? I'm really not here to predict the future of education for you, okay? I'm really not here to predict anything for you. I'm really here just to be thought provocative and to help you challenge yourself. What the forecast does, and what I hope I do today, though, will help you to begin thinking about the direction of change for which you need to prepare for. And with that, I'm going to explain a little bit about what I mean about prediction versus forecasting. So in the 1950s and in the 1960s, you know, a lot of sci-fi writers or uh, future forecasters, they predicted we'd have an Internet, right? And, and just like your minister said, you know, even 10, 20 years ago, it was not used at the rate it is now. So, so people actually predicted there would be an Internet. And so they understood the direction of change. But with that, they made it, they made it kind of a bolder prediction. They predicted... That, the, that there would be a quick death of the book. And as a result, the Internet, however, launched Amazon.com, which in the States is now one of the biggest companies. And if anything, books proliferated, but bookstores withered. So the direction and the forecast was right, that there would be an inter Internet. The prediction that the book would die and we'd no longer use books actually was inaccurate. And that's the difference that I'm talking about today, about having you think broadly about the future, but I'm not here to say this is exactly what the future is going to look like, because that's actually up, for you, that's up to you to actually construct that future. But what's up for, to you is that you actually integrate some of these drivers and changes that we're going to talk about. The other place I want to challenge you a little bit about is how the future is creating new literacies. So your report was, um, was very clear um, and directive and helpful about how to improve numeracy and literacy. But we really have to think about the fact that information no longer comes to us just on a piece of paper, but more and more through powerful images and sounds of our multimedia culture. So as a result, being literate in the 21st century cannot be bound to the 19th century meaning. So how do we bring new meaning to literacy? So instead, literacy has to integrate multiple forms of literacy as our future depends on our use ability to work within different representations and with different tools. So who could survive a couple of days without any of this technology that's on this slide? So the availability of these tools, though, they're changing how we access information, they're changing how we communicate, and they're changing how we learn, and they change how we contribute to the development of products. So how, then, can we redefine literacy? A lot of literacy is going to be visual, right? But, you know, basically we've been saying for a while we've got information overload, that all, all the Internet has done is kind of create a knowledge economy and we've got too much information. How do we go through it? How do we weigh it? And how do we become critical thinkers about it? And so we have to think about how then we can become, how we can display information and data more visibly and how we use visible information to, sen to make sense of the world or to make sense of data or what we call sense-making. 
So tomorrow's future is going to require individuals to be able to discern meaningful patterns from information or data and communicate meaningful patterns from this information or data. That's a whole new form of literacy. You can call that visual literacy. You can call it pattern recognition. I'm sure there's other names that we can call it as well. So consider this fact. Much of the modern science can no longer even be con communicated in print. The DNA sequences, molecular models, medical imaging scans, brain maps, simulated flights through a terrain, simulations of fluid flow, and so on. They all have to be taught visually. Despite all of this, text-driven instruction dominates our students' formal schooling. So while New Zealand and others are focused on literacy, we have to ask, how can we use images and visual literacy as the predominant means of instruction or as one of the primary means of instruction? And how can we help our youth develop new skills in creating and discerning meaningful patterns from data? So we're, we're now at, at this example here. And we can still use visual literacy to help with vocabulary words, right? But you can also use visual literacy to help explore content and concepts and extend literacy development, but also integrate technology. So this shows words that speakers used at our most recent national convention before President Obama was elected. So essentially somebody just you know, used this lower part and they counted the number of times a word was said. God, energy, Obama, taxes, McCain, that kind of thing. And, and we could have just looked at a simple graph like that below and looked for the patterns right there and then. But instead, someone decided to visualize this and put up there in different kind of visualizations to show magnification and emphasis the, the way that words were used. So essentially, we're now showing visually what happened. And so creating a graph that captured the number of times speakers used was in some ways you know, rather boring and, and made it harder for you to see the patterns. But if you create a visualization of the actuality of the words that was collected, you can start integrate the numerical data into a visualization. With this visualization, the reader can be visually shown the information to determine and assess patterns for themselves. Visualization can reach students, and that it develops additional skills. But visualization can also reach stu students who learn differently, right? And I'm sure many of you know that. It supports the notions of multiple intelligence, the multimodal teaching. So all of us are not the same kind of learners. We all learn differently. We all learn through kinetic or visualization or text or, or, or oratory or anything else. So how do we use visualization to help that? The internet and other information and communication technology brings about new ways of doing literacy tasks. So that's really great, anything from Wordle and mind maps. But it also helps us create new social practices, skills, strategies, dispositions, and new literacies for our youth. And I really challenge New Zealand to think differently and more broadly about the use of literacy. Now this is always a fun picture. This is the whole big brother watching, right? So for good or bad, you know, um, we have the opportunity to help students um, detect patterns even by the personalized data that's collected from folks. So basically, we live in a world where any act we do can be traced, right? Kind of scary if you think about it. So we leave a data trail. It might be something we do by crossing a street and there's a camera that happens to be there. It might be when we take money out of our ATM and there's a camera that photographs that. But it also might be when we're on a website and we, we identify what our likes are around reading or books or anything else. All of this data is collected, but it basically puts together a robust and invisible data picture of our lives as citizens, as workers, and as learners. So as learners, what do we want to capture about our students that we can do now that we've never had the opportunity to do? And one of those things just is the simple way that we use testing. So a very common way that um, we're starting to use um, in the States is really we're starting to use a lot more of the computer adaptive testing. Are you guys doing a lot of that here? Okay, well, so what happens is that it's a computer adaptive test. It selects my questions for me, and it maximizes the precision of my answers, and then it provides the next question of difficulty or maybe even ease based on my first answer. So essentially, it adapts to what I know and I don't know because it gives real-time information on what I'm really learning and what I'm not learning. And then I can intervene as a teacher whether it's individually or whether it's classroom. The other thing we can do, thanks to technology that's also around literacy, is the fact that we'll have new learning geographies. So another form of pattern recognition and new literacies is really about our location and context of others. So the question used to be, you know, um, where are you? Well, now we don't really care where somebody is. It's where are you in relationship to A, B, and C? So if you look at this um, smartphone here on this, on this slide, 
Imagine like, imagine me yesterday, maybe if I was walking down, you know, on the waterfront, walking over towards Te Papa, and everything was tagged on that, you know, boulevard, on that promenade that showed me what I was looking at across the bay, showed me uh, who created this form of public art, who developed the water sculpture, that all I had to do was point to it with my smartphone. And it would tell me everything I needed to know about the context of the geography in which I'm walking through. That's really what we're talking about when we have new learning geographies. Essentially, new technologies for interacting and displaying information about our physical environment, they've created this metaverse that blends digital and physical realities. So as such technologies evolve and their availability increases, new possibilities for learning can emerge. So given our access to virtual environments, we can extend a sense of place to the future, current, and past, or give exponential meaning for educational value of virtual worlds. We have blended realities that can create new learning geographies that advances a pedagogy of multi, multiple literacies, gives us multiple resources and communication forms, and it shows us how knowledge is produced and how we can integrate it every day in our life. Another popular, and yet sometimes controversial, is how we use games as a form of literacy or games as a way that we practice learning. So one of our, emergency, our emerging literacies are how we see the world around us and how we develop knowledge, but we're seeing games that become platforms for serious practice of literacy, for skills, and for language acquisition. Many of you have heard of Facebook and Twitter and all of those things, and we all thought that was a fad, right, that students go there for fun. Social media is just a communication group just to have fun with and, and all of that. But in reality, this is changing the DNA of our students. Young people are growing up adept at using technology and social media tools that enable them to reach out and expand their social networks, or they use wikis and other tools to help make sense and contribute to information. So while we think that it's a fun activity, there are certainly ways that we can think about how we integrate this into class. So as we come to a close, um, I want to talk a little bit about the themes that you saw, and that is the future is personalized, localized, collaborative, connective, modular, flexible, digital, visual, and I would add that I didn't have on here, it's literate. So we need to improve literacy and numeracy, but entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity must be cultivated and extended to all students in your country by harnessing technology more powerfully and seamlessly to truly create a new economy and redefine student success. So how do you prepare students to help New Zealand lead in developing a new economy? What would that new economy look like, and how would you develop students to lead that economy? How do we broadly and rapidly expand our literacies but also use technology to improve numeracy and literacy? And how do we support schools to become engaged in a culture of contribution, connectivity, sharing, collaboration globally? It would be remiss not to suggest that this is going to require a lot of work in terms of how you develop and support teachers, whether it's teacher preparation or whether it's professional development for teachers who are in the field you have to start grappling with these questions and you, start having, you have to start developing the capacity of your teachers to use these type of tools for literacy development and for all the development of multiple literacies as well as creativity and entrepreneurship. At KnowledgeWorks, we believe it's important for folks like you that come to these presentations to really think about how you're going to be the leaders in creating this new society. Not for today, but for tomorrow and for 10 years and 20 years from now. And I believe that New Zealand is a leader and can even do more. You're small enough and you have an efficient system that I think you guys can do a lot. You have the vision, you have the understanding, you have the resources, you have the system, you have the opportunity, and you have the needs. We like to share the 2020 forecast to ensure that people understand that the future is not a monolith. It hasn't been created for us. We are the folks who get to create it. You are the folks who get to create the future. The future just doesn't happen to you. You don't want the future to happen to you. You want to create the future. So it's my hope that you'll use this forecast that was in your, in your bag and you'll use this presentation as context to help inform the creative and more cutting edge options you have as you execute the statement of intent around early childhood, literacy and numeracy, the tertiary system, and other, early, other equally um, important initiatives and recommendations from such reports as the um, Kahekatea, the report Managing for Success, the, Pacific, uh, the Pacifica Education Plan, and others that were referred today as well. So it's my hope that you will use those reports and you'll take them to a very different level based on some of the things you've heard today and some of the things that are in the handout that you received from the KnowledgeWorks Foundation.